Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief. On the show today, based on India's announcement of a national green hydrogen mission, we examine the question of what exactly is uh, green hydrogen, both from a science as well as a political economy perspective. And uh, we look at protests in Somaliland and get a better understanding of what the ongoing dispute there is. First up, India's central government, in an announcement made with much fanfare by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, has announced a national green hydrogen mission. Typical of these announcements in the recent past has been the attachment of a suitably enticing figure, in this case 20,000 crore rupees. That's approximately 2.5 billion US dollars. But to what exactly? We don't know yet. In absolute terms, India is the third largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world. So obviously the aim of the mission is to reduce emissions. But what is the science behind green hydrogen? Who will develop the technology? And of course, who will pay for it? To understand both the science as well as uh, these other aspects of the political economy of hydrogen uh, and renewable energies, of course, we're joined in studio by Prabir Pukhaista. Uh, Prabir, before we uh, sat down to do the show, you were having a, a laugh at my understanding of the world of science. Uh, so just keeping it as simple as you can for, for my benefit and for those of our viewers who are also uh, in the same boat, what does this color coding of hydrogen mean? Well, let's be very clear. This blue, gray, green hydrogen has nothing to do with the color of hydrogen. It's basically to say if hydrogen is produced by certain methods, then how damaging it is to the environment, which means that how much carbon dioxide is emitted as a consequence. So the gray hydrogen is obviously the worst because you are converting hydrogen and letting carbon dioxide get into the atmosphere. Okay. That's the quote-unquote gray hydrogen. This has been around for quite some time. In fact, refineries use a lot of uh, hydrogen, and they're obviously the, the way they produce it is using natural gas, uh, burn, you know, effectively uh, using that energy to convert uh, in the part of it into hydrogen. hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So that that process liberates uh, that part of the natural gas, which is carbon, because it's after all CH3 mm. or other hydrocarbons, there mm. is a carbon component mm. to it. So that sort of burnt off, the hydrogen part remains in some form or the other, and that's the one which is then uh, used in the refinery process where hydrogen actually is required for certain processes. So that is one part of it. So this used to be called, well, hydrogen, hydrogen. for refineries. But now it's being talked about grey hydrogen, not because of anything else, but because the uh, oil companies want to market something called blue hydrogen, which is not going to be uh, damaging to the environment. And their argument is we can take this carbon dioxide, which is being produced as uh, getting hydrogen out of natural gas, and that we will sink in a carbon capture, capture uh, plant. Hmm. That means it will capture, separate the carbon dioxide produced and then after separation uh, store it underground, what's called carbon capture storage. Hmm. For how long and what, we don't discuss it that, hmm. but it will be it, that will be done and the result will be then the hydrogen that is there can be used for various purposes. There is a derivative of that process by which you can also produce ammonia mm. and therefore the green blue ammonia is also being discussed. Right. Now all of them are to say that after that we don't have to worry about the fact there is carbon dioxide except the question that arises if that works, why aren't we doing it for all carbon burning uh, processes which could be coal, oil or uh, natural yes. gas? And the answer is very simple because this carbon capture mechanism which started with coal actually has failed. And the reason for that failure is high capital cost, but that's only one. Mm. The other is also it needs a lot of energy, including uh, the separation process that is being talked of, how to separate from hydrogen, say, the carbon dioxide. In the other case, if you burn coal from nitrogen, mm. carbon dioxide, so all of these processes also require energy. And what we have found, apart from the high capital cost, is mm. the cost of that energy mm. is also high. In fact, do you get a net positive out of that? The answer is probably no. We might have to spend more energy than uh, you know, not burning the coal at all. Mm. So instead of 
then getting a net positive, we are getting still a net negative with carbon capture because we are then producing more carbon dioxide than we are sinking into the uh, you know, so-called carbon storage. Mm. So these are the reasons why carbon capture methods don't look very promising as of now. So if we look at this, the blue uh, hydrogen, hydrogen is just another way of con continuing to burn natural gas and oil for as long as they can do. And this rebranding exercise is basically public relations. Mm. This is what the tobacco companies did. If you remember, this is what the oil companies have been, been doing, doing first deny nothing yeah. it's not dangerous yeah. no, tobacco fact, not attack dangerous attack science itself attack science science denial hmm. then okay we are doing something what are we doing we are giving you filters hmm. in your cigarettes we are making less nicotine uh, producing cigarettes better cigarettes healthier cigarettes lighter cigarettes lighter <laughs> cigarettes all of that branding yeah. so the same branding exercise first deny science exxon has known for a long period that this hmm. is cli global cli climate change global warming etc so deny science when you can no longer deny it then claim that we are, take, we are taking mitigation measures and therefore the grey, blue, hydrogen is being talked of. The reality is there is no way to burn natural gas and coal and at the moment provide a safe way of doing it. Hmm. That's the reality. So we'll have to phase them out. The question is how and when. Hmm. And the oil company's answer is as long as they can postpone the inevitable, well, they make profits, tens, yeah. 20, 30 billions billion of, dollars of dollars of profits are involved. If you take all the oil companies, you talk hundreds of billions of hmm. dollars. So how to protect that as long as they can? They will take the human society, human humanity. Hmm. That's it. Uh, and uh, Prabir, we've also seen that uh, governments uh, are as complicit in this entire process of rebranding and uh, PR as the companies themselves. Obviously, they are uh, closely connected. Uh, with, uh, with the peg of India's now national green mission, uh, green hydrogen mission, uh, what sense does it make for, for a country that it is a large uh, producer of carbon dioxide, even though small per capita? Uh, is this a direction that uh, from an energy perspective or even from an environment perspective makes any sense to take at this point? Oh yes, I think green hydrogen, if we want to have certain kinds of processes continue, say cars, okay, uh, buses, in fact more buses and trucks than for cars, then instead of the electric vehicle route, mm. it makes sense to take the hydrogen route or if you want to use hydrogen, even it can be used in normal truck engine, which as you know, CNG, CNG. engines actually are internal combustion engines yeah. and therefore you can burn hydrogen in, in that. So the question is, when producing hydrogen, mm. what's the difference between the color blue, green hydrogen, as it is called, mm. uh, other thing called green and blue hydrogen. Mm. So the origin of green hydrogen is not oil, not coal. So there are natural gas. Mm. So it is really producing it through, say, surplus renewable energy, yeah. which means you have wind at night, mm. but there is no, then may not be enough takers. Mm. So you have periods where renewable energy there are no takers. Mm. So you have storage issue. Mm. The storage issue, one storage could be batteries, mm. but they are for short-term storage. Mm. Long-term storage could be either hydrogen or what is called reversible hydro. We don't get into it today, yeah. but reversible hydro is something India can do because it has a lot of hydroelectric resources mm. already. Reserv reservoirs exist, so they pump water up. Similarly, you can also convert it to hydrogen by electrolyzing water. And if you do that, then you get oxygen and hydrogen. Of course, oxygen has a limited use except for hospitals and so on, mm. industry. But hydrogen can be used directly as energy. So if you have surplus, surplus renewable energy, instead of not using it at all, mm. you can actually use it to produce quote-unquote green hydrogen because this is not polluting. Mm. So you get at the end of it hydrogen and oxygen. Mm. And if you get hydrogen, then burning it only produces water. So it can be done in two ways. You can directly use it in internal combustion engine, which is equivalent to burning it. Or you can use a, what is called a fuel cell and convert it directly to electricity and then use an electric motor like any electric vehicle and use it. It is very clear that hydrogen under compression, and that's true for green ammonia as well, because a similar process can be used for ammonia. They can be used 
because they're compressed, you can actually store a lot of it under pressure and you can use it for long distance trucks or buses. Now, trucks and buses, the electric vehicles don't work, work because there is not enough storage in the batteries. Yep. I have already earlier in my various uh, columns and writings have talked about the renewable energy storage problem. Hmm. And this is the storage problem that you cannot, the EVs are not a route for solving this problem. Mm. And 75% or 80% of the transport uh, energy that, uh, that is utilized. spent, yeah. utilized, is really using diesel commercial or vehicles. Uh, commercial oh. vehicles, yeah. even CNG, in internal combustion engines. Mm. So therefore, that 80% fuel uh, that can be saved, mm. if green energy is used, would then obviously avoid that much of emissions. Mm. Transport problem is not private cars. 80% of our transport problem is from trucks and buses. So mm. public transport, of course, also reduces emissions anyway. Yeah. But more than that, we have to find a solution. So either rail, electric vehicles, charging issue, mm. as we know, battery is a problem. And then the only long-term solution, therefore, is to look at uh, essentially either ammonia or green ammonia or green, green hydrogen, hydrogen for powering this sector, mm. which is really buses and trucks, mm. long distance traffic. Of course, people might argue, since you, you should have really metros and mm. uh, long distance electric uh, rail, uh, mm. rail, railways, mm. they are much better, and I agree with that. But you will always have some need for yeah. this. So whenever you have that to supplement, then I think this green hydrogen does does provide an alternative, yeah, and therefore I think green hydrogen should be a part of a longer term, longer term solution to the climate change crisis. Right. Your uh, our piece on NewsClick today uh, is headlined "Profit for I mean Profit for the private players in this sector and hot air for the rest of us." Uh, from a policy perspective, very broadly, if you can just summarize the direction in which most major countries at least are taking in this regard. Well, there is a technology part of it, there is a political economy part of it. Technology part of it we have discussed, yeah. that doesn't change. Yeah. The political economy part is who develops the technology, who pays for it, who profits when finally it is put into operation, who profits from it. Who is getting the money from this, say, the 20,000 crore, two and a half billion dollars mm. uh, green energy program, green hydrogen program, which the government has taken? A part of it is also the green ammonia program, mm. which essentially is for your fertilizer mm. production, which is very important, important. for agricultural economy like India. Yeah. So, given that, it, the, if we look at the major outline of that, it is to fund private capital to put up various kinds of plants, mm. and that. Fund funding will be provided by the government. How much it of, will it be grant? Will mm. it be loan? Will it will be uh, written off? We don't know. Mm. The details of that are not available. But it's very clear that a significant amount of support is going to be given to private capital to put up such green hydrogen facilities, either for production of green hydrogen or for production and its use. Yeah. So this is this is one part of it, and that's why I've said that whether it's green ammonia or it is green hydrogen, it's going to be subsidizing capital. Mm. And even for producing electrolyzers, because you electrolyze water to produce hydrogen and oxygen, mm. therefore this hydrogen comes from electricity. But you need electrolyzers on a large industrial scale, mm. and for that, therefore, the government has to there is providing the manufacturing facility subsidy so to produce these electrolyzers but there's not the talk of developing technology mm. for that out of the 20,000 crores only about a minuscule so 400 right. crores seems to be earmarked for this the point is in the future whoever makes the electrolyzers whoever makes the fuel cells which utilizes hydrogen, mm. they are the ones which are going to hold the market as you have seen for chips. Yeah. It is a, not the chip manufacturer, mm. it is the ones who manufacture, manufacture the equipment for chip manufacturer yeah. who actually command the uh, economy. Mm. So that is where the technology issues arise. Otherwise you'll be buying technology or you'll be asking foreign capital to send up technology mm. or the reliances of this world, the Ambani's, Adani's, yeah. Birla's, Tata's, they will set up big facilities, but buy technology from outside the way refineries today are set up. All right, thank you very much, Prabir, for that. Our second and final story today, at least 20 people have been killed in Somaliland in violence between anti-government protesters and security forces over several days. This is according to multiple reports coming in from the region. 
Though it's an ongoing dispute, Somaliland has been largely peaceful. And this current wave of violence signals some kind of turning point in the situation on the ground. As a country with oil reserves and because of its geographic location in the Horn of Africa, stability in Somalia is crucial not just for the country itself, but the region as a whole. As always, of course, there are direct imperialist interests that do not always benefit from a stable, peaceful and united Somalia. To give us a fuller picture of the situation on the ground, as well as the powers at play, Prashant now joins us. Prashant, welcome back to Daily Debrief. Uh, the Somaliland dispute has been on since the early 90s, but uh, not received too much media attention, not too well understood around the world. Uh, so for the sake of our viewers uh, and all of us, uh, could you paint the scenario as it is at the moment? Right. So, of course, we talk about it in the context of recent protests that have been taking place in Somaliland. So, Somaliland is a de facto state. It's internationally, uh, most many countries recognize it as part of Somalia, of course. Now, uh, like you said, this is an issue where within the pre-90s, before the 90s, it was not really an issue. It is only 1991, I believe, that the declaration took place. Now, the important thing is that there are very close ties, of course, between Somalia and what is called Somaliland. Mm. And the protests right now that are happening also are largely based on that because there is, at, le at least in certain states, a very strong sentiment of wanting to integrate further with uh, Somalia. Somalia. Now, in Somalia itself, largely there is a lot of, uh, a lot of the politics is based on clans and their networks. And what we do know also is that Somaliland, especially, there are quite a few influential clans, but it is one clan primarily, which, you know, uh, has been at the forefront of demanding a separate country. Mm. Now, uh, on the other hand, over the past few decades, we've also seen, in the, especially among the youth, an increasing uh, tendency or increasing spirit of belief in further integration and this seems to be what is spurring those protests. Now, some of the protests took place in the last week of December. There was uh, violence, I believe about 20 people were killed. There have been protests reported also on the 12th of January, I believe. Now, the significance of this is a larger question of the sovereignty of integrity of Somalia itself. Now, we do know that Somalia has long been a playground uh, for various foreign powers. At some point, the United States actually intervened uh, in Somalia, we also know that there's mm. been a lot of violence, also Islamist violence, for instance, and all of this has led to a very weakened federal government in the country, and which has not really been able to exert its authority. There's the absence of a very strong unified army, for instance, and all of this has made Somalia the perception of it being some kind of a failed state. And now it's this is significant when you consider Somalia's position in the globe, uh, in the Horn of Africa, its vital position near the Suez Canal and the Red Sea, for instance. And also it has oil reserves, which are equally very important. Mm. Now, all of these aspects uh, put together, it uh, the picture dynamically changes if there is a Somalia which is united, integrated, and under a strong federal government mm. because it makes it a much more sovereign country. right? right. And this is what many forces, I think, would not specifically like because mm. it allows them to actually dictate the interests uh, in various smaller regions as opposed to a federal government which might have more power, uh, powerful yeah. power and control. Yeah. So that's really, I think, the heart of the issue here, the mm. question of an integrated, unified Somalia versus a more federated, broken down structure where local leaders, clan leaders, for instance, can then dictate the terms of what is happening. Mm. Now, this is all the more important when we consider the fact that oil is also a factor here. For instance, mm. a company called Janelle, which is listed in the London stock market, has mm. claimed the right to exploit some of these oil reserves in Somaliland. Yeah. And the federal government of Somalia has objected uh, to this issue. And, uh, you know, this has raised a lot of controversy. Around the same time, we also know that, uh, uh, for instance, the Joe Biden administration, the recent document, referred to Somaliland itself, and it was considered a divergence from its usual one Somalia policy. Mm. So all of these are interesting geopolitical issues that are playing out, but ultimately the larger question is regarding uh, the uh, integrity and sovereignty of countries in the Horn of Africa itself. There are also reports coming in of, uh, for example, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the, the U.S.'s military intervention in, in Somalia. Uh, there are recent reports coming in of U.S. troops once again training in Somaliland, in fact. Uh, what, what role or what uh, part uh, does U.S. imperialism play in this region and, and what is sort of the U.S. agenda here? Right. So uh, the Horn of Africa, like we said, like we talked about before, is a very crucial region. And there are processes taking place in the Horn of Africa, which are not specific, are not particularly to the liking of the United States administration. For instance, we know that Ethiopia is a key country in this process. Ethiopia was under the control of the TPLF for the longest time. Now under Abiy Ahmed, it has taken a different path. The TPLF then staged this whole revolt. It is seems to have entered at least on paper as of now. Mm. So 
even there it was a very similar question. The, the question of whether Ethiopia would be an independent sovereign country which would have its own interests, which would pursue its own path as opposed to it being more of a client fractured. state of the West mm. and a fractured state, right? Mm. And we know that Ethiopia, Eritrea and Somalia, for instance, there have been attempts to sort of have more discussions between these countries. So the integrity of Somalia is also very relevant in this context because what it would mean is, uh, uh, you know, a strong uni unified Somalia would mean a pos the possibility of a different path for countries as a, as a whole in that yeah. region. Also important to remember that in this context, that Somalia does not have a one person, one vote system. And this is something that progressive forces have been demanding for a long time, because the fact that this would mean that the influence of the clan leaders, the influence mm. of local interests could be broken by a democratic process. Right. And this is something that, uh, you know, very sections of the Somali, Somali, Somalian political establishment have strong, long opposed because, for this reason, because yeah. it gives, takes away their power. Their right? power yeah. right. Similarly, the same thing with Abi Ahmed as well, who has been trying to sort of bring, a, bring about a larger Ethiopian nationalistic perspective, as opposed to various clan and regional mm. perspectives which are dominant for the longest time. Mm. So, the, I think the larger question is of the future of the Horn of Africa itself. Are we going to see a group of countries which uh, have, of course, certain common interests in certain common contexts because of their location and which work closely together? Or are we likely to see more sectional and divided uh, regions, uh, many of which could be under the umbrella of the United States or its allies? And I think this is one very crucial battle uh, which will go on for quite a few decades as well. All right. Thanks very much for that update, Prashant. And with that also, we wrap up this episode of Daily Debrief uh, from myself and the entire team here at People's Dispatch. Thank you very much for watching. As always, we invi invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Also, don't forget to follow us on the uh, social media platform of your choice if you haven't done so already. Uh, we'll be back on Monday with another episode of the Daily Debrief. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.